wasn't last week, but last time we met, um, last time we met, we went over the question that was asked. Anybody remember that? There's a question in Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, the last verse of the Bible, I mean of chapter 6, and it says, um, it asks the question, who is able to stand? The wrath of the Lamb has come, and who is able to stand, right? And then chapter 7 focuses on that answer. The whole chapter is answering that question for John. It's the interlude between the sixth and the seventh seal. So, the, the first thing that John sees is the number 144,000. I know I'm going kind of quick because we covered this last couple weeks ago, um, and we're moving into new territory tonight. So if you missed it, I recommend you go on to Miles' YouTube page or Facebook. I don't know where Justin is doing. Justin, do you catalog these anywhere or archive them anywhere on a website, or you want to give us information on that? YouTube. Okay. So what is Miles' YouTube page? Okay, so just go to YouTube, search Miles Seven Day Adventist Church, and there you can find, if you missed it and you're curious about uh, the 144,000, the great multitude. So we're just going to review a tiny bit of that today, and we'll move on, but you'll have to go there for more in-depth study on the proof. So the 12 tribes of Israel do not exist today, so that's why we know that the literal, that, that it can't be a literal number, the 144,000 can't be a literal number. The 12 tribes of Israel can't be traced. Of Babylon and Rome, and since Revelation is largely a symbolic book, this number should not be taken as literal. 2 Kings 17, 6 through 23 highlights the Israeli captivity into Assyria, and so the ten northern tribes became dispersed among the surrounding nations and disappeared. So then the two remaining tribes, Benjamin and Judah, were taken into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. They later returned to Palestine and were known as the Jews of the New Testament area. And after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Jews were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. So when Jesus was talking to the Jews at that time, he was actually speaking to the tribes of Benjamin and Judah and not the other tribes. There might have been a few of them mixed in there, but for the most part, he was referring to the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. The other ones had been completely scattered by then. And when you look at Acts chapter 2, you see all these Jews come back and you hear uh, Peter speak preaching his sermon, and he's speaking in, in different languages, but they all hear one another in their own language. Those are what we call diaspora Jews. In other words, those ones who were dispersed, they're called diaspora, and they are probably from the other tribes that were already located all over the, the, the country at that time. So <clears throat> the second reason why this number can't be literal is the list of tribes in Revelation 7 is not an original list. Judah is listed as the first tribe because Judah came from, um, because Jesus came from this tribe, and the tribes of Dan and Ephraim are missing while Joseph and Levi are included. So this is a theological list and not a historical list. So Dan turned to idolatry and backbiting when he should have been a judge, and you can find that in those references. And then Ephraim in the Old Testament is a symbol of apostasy and idolatry. And remember, we talked about the see here principle. Does anybody remember what the see here principle is? I think you're the only one who was here out of everybody. So do you remember what the see here principle was? Mm -hmm. Okay. So remember, when we went through this in Revelation chapter 7, John, he, he hears, um, he hears the number 144,000, but he sees the great multitude. So in Revelation 1.10, John hears a voice like a trumpet. Then he sees the voice in chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. In Revelation 5.5, John hears the lion of the Judah has overcome. Then he sees a lamb. And then in Revelation 17.1, John hears a harlot sitting on many waters. But in chapter 17, verse 3, he sees a prostitute sitting on a beast. So why is there a see here principle in Revelation? It's symbolic, very good, it is symbolic, but why, why does John see or hear one thing and then see another? What is the purpose of that? Let me ask you a question. Why is there three Gospels? Why are there three synoptic Gospels? In other words, why are there three Gospels that are almost the same? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
different perspective. John is describing the same event from a different perspective. In other words, let me show you an example. So the easiest one is Revelation 5.5. John hears a lion of Judah has overcome. He has become the king. He is the king of the beast, right? Jesus has become the king of the universe, so he's represented as a lion. But then in verse 6, he sees him as a lamb. Why? Because God is showing us how he became a lion. It was through being a lamb, being a sacrificial animal. So what John sees and hears are the same thing from a different perspective. John hears the 144,000, but sees the great multitude, which no one can number. The 144,000 represents God's people who go through the tribulation. The great multitude are the same group of people who have been brought through that time and are victorious. The war is over and the 144,000 are no longer arranged into military units. They are all mingled together enjoying the joyous celebration. This is what, I mean, this is what happens when every war is over. So as you see, if you go through the book of Numbers, if you go through the book of Leviticus, um, it might be some in Leviticus, mostly through Numbers and some in Deuteronomy, and then you go through Chronicles, for sure you'll see it. As the Israelites are going into the war, they're always numbered by what? What? Someone said it. By tribes, right? So many from the tribe of Reuben, so many from the tribe of Gad, so many from the tribe of Asher, so many from the tribe of Judah, so many from the tribe of Benjamin, and on and on and on. You guys get it, right? They're always listed that way, but after the war is over, how are they listed? As a group. There's no more list, right? Because the war is over. Now they're not a military unit. Now they're just celebrating freely with everybody, right? And so we see that same concept here with the 144,000. They go in numbered as for war because they're in this great tribulation. They're going through the... Um, they're going through the great tribulation or the plagues, and then we see um, the great multitude come out because they are victorious, and now they're just celebrating because we know that Jesus is coming. So that's what we discovered. Oh, never mind. I got another slide. We have seen so far that Revelation portrays God's end-time people from two angles. First, they are seen as the sealed, 144,000, just before the tribulation, known as the seven last plagues. Second, they are noticed as the great multitude that went through the tribulation. Their earthly journey is over, and now they stand before the throne of God in his temple. So now we're ready to move on to Revelation chapter 8 and the seals, I'm sorry, and the trumpets. But before we do, we have to cover the last seal. So remember, Revelation chapter 6 ends with the sixth seal. And what happens during the sixth seal? Give you a big clue. It's a major event that every eye sees and every ear hears. <laughs> the second coming of Jesus. Amen? And then the question is asked, who is able to stand when this happens? Revelation 7 answers it. And then Revelation 8 concludes the seventh seal. So after describing those who will be able to stand at Christ's second coming, John describes the opening of the seventh seal by Jesus, the Lamb. Revelation 8.1, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. You know, it's interesting. I was sitting in a Sabbath school class one time, and I'm just saying this as a joke. There's no truth to this. I was sitting in Sabbath school class one time, and this doctor said, do you know that there's not going to be any women in heaven? Everybody's like, no. No, and all the women, of course, got angry and upset. They looked at him like, where are you going with this? He's like, I'm serious. It's biblical. There is not going to be any women in heaven. And all the women are like, whatever, show us that verse. So he went to Revelation 8, 1, and he said, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. <laughs> all right. So the Bible says that there is silence in heaven for half an hour, but it is not talking about women. It is talking about complete silence in heaven. Um, so what does this mean? Let's look at this. So in Bible prophecy, day represents a what? A year. And we go by a Jewish calendar. So how many days in a year? 360. So that would mean that if we took 360 and we divided it by 24, we'd get how many? 15. So one prophetic hour equals how many days? 15 days. So we have a half an hour here. What does that mean? That means that there's silence in heaven for how much time? Seven and a half days. Very good. Thank you. So silence in heaven for seven and a half days. So let's keep in mind as we're going through this seal that the sixth seal pictures the second coming of Jesus. So that means that the events of the seventh seal must take place when? It 
it's exactly. It's not a trick question, guys. Feel free to speak up. I know there's a few of us, but it's okay. Just speak up, right? So the seventh seal takes place after the sixth seal, right? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but two follows one, three follows two, four follows three, five follows four, six follows 22. A couple of you looked at me, but no one said nothing. I was just trying to see if anybody's going to talk. All right? Six follows five. Seven follows six. And if the second coming of Jesus is the sixth seal, that means that the seventh seal, which follows the sixth seal, must take place after the second coming of Jesus. Right? Okay. So that means that this seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. So after Jesus comes, then there's silence in heaven for the span of a half an hour or about seven and a half days. So what is taking place here? What's going on? Seven day all expenses trip paid. I'm seven day all expenses paid trip to heaven. He gazed on the, gra on the graves of the sleeping saints, then raised his eyes and hands to heaven and cried, awake, awake, awake. You that sleep in the dust and arise. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to hear our master say, awake, awake, awake. Because even if I'm not dead, I look forward to reuniting with my loved ones that have passed before me. And when they awake and we all get this paid trip to heaven, it's going to be the most joyous day this universe has ever seen for us. Then there was a mighty earthquake. The graves opened and the dead came up clothed with what? Immortality. The 144,000 shouted, hallelujah, as they recognized their friends who had been torn from death. And in the same moment, we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the clouds together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads. That is early writings, page 16. So we are going to be ascending into heaven for how many days? Seven days. So we know the sea of glass is equivalent to standing before God's throne. So we know that the sea of glass is in heaven. So it's going to take seven days for the righteous living and the righteous dead to be caught up in the air and walk with Jesus into heaven. About seven and a half days, actually. So... Jesus gives us a seven-day sightseeing evangelistic meeting. Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So, why does it take seven days for us to get into heaven? Why? Couldn't Jesus just get us there like that? Couldn't he just speak us to heaven if he wanted to? Couldn't he just catch us up and throw us there? So what is he doing during the seven-day period? What is the purpose of it? What is the point of it? The people who have been martyred during the 1260 years or the first six seals didn't have all the truth. They didn't have all the truth. Truth is what? Progressive. And it's progressive not only in the church, not only in society, but in our individual lives. And aren't we all happy that the truth is progressive in our individual lives? Say amen if you're happy that God reveals the truth to us progressively. Amen. Because it would be a shock to the system if God just all of a sudden said, Jay, you got this wrong, 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 and you better change now. You understand? It'd be a low overload to the senses. I would shrink underneath the weight of responsibility, and I wouldn't be able to do anything because I wouldn't be able to think right. Amen? And so God reveals the truth to us progressively. That's why there are some people out there that have never heard of the Sabbath. They worship on Sunday. They are perfectly right with Jesus because they're doing what they know to do. They haven't heard of it. And then all of a sudden, some crazy day, somebody in their family gets baptized or some preacher or Bible worker ends up on their door or they hear us on the radio. They, hey, hey, the real day to worship is on the Sabbath. And they are shocked because they had never heard that before because the truth is progressive. God gives it to us when we're ready for it. And so now these people who have died through time haven't had a chance to hear the truth. Why didn't they have all the truth? Did the apostles teach the entirety of truth? It's a very easy question. Well, yeah, but we're talking about the apostles. They were prophets. I mean, they talked to God. Did the apostles teach the entirety of truth? 
If they didn't teach the entirety of truth, brothers and sisters, there's no more truth for us to have because we study what they wrote down. Amen? And if it's not in the Bible, we're not going to get more truth. You understand what I'm saying? So did they teach the entirety of truth? Yes. They gave us everything that Jesus wants us to know to get into heaven. Amen? That is the entirety of truth that Jesus holds us responsible for. He says, this is what you need to know. It's in my book. Learn it. Follow it. You'll be fine. Right? They taught the entirety of truth. So how come those living after them up through the 1,260 years did not have the entirety of truth? Go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. If you feel like I'm yelling at you, I'm sorry. You just look a little sleepy. You're a little sluggish out there, so I thought a little motivation, a little energy might be helpful tonight. <laughs> Daniel chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Daniel chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the what? Truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Why do they not have the truth? Because the leading bodies of the time, the church membership at the time, the leaders of the church at the time, cast the truth to the ground, and they didn't have a chance to know the truth. Now, here's the thing about truth. God holds us accountable for what we know. Amen? He says, you're accountable for what I teach you. When I give you truth, you're accountable to walk in it. Before then, you can't be held accountable. That's why there's many, many good people who have worshipped on Sunday their entire lives, and they are going to be in heaven just with us who worship on Sabbath. The reason why is because they are living to the truth that they know. But when God gives us new truth, when he says, hey, here's something you didn't know, I just wanted you to move on with this because I got some plans for you, and you have this truth to do that, then he holds us accountable for the truth that he gives us. We can find this principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians 8. In verse 12, the Bible tells us that we are held accountable for the truth that we have, but not the truth that we don't have. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 12. Coincidentally, as you're turning there, I'll tell you a quick story. One of this major, in fact, was Pastor Torres, my, 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 my mentor in evangelism, if you will. I don't know if he'd be proud of that statement, but I am. In my mentor in evangelism, I haven't learned everything he has to say, probably didn't learn as much as he wanted to give me, but I learned as much as I could with the limited capacity in my mind that I have. He told us the story that he used to go see his brother, and he was witnessing to him. Now, if you don't know Pastor Torres' story, he used to play bass for Bill Haley in the Comets, which is a really old band right now, and nobody remembers him anymore, but they sang that song, Rock Around the Clock, right? And also... Um, the Happy Days theme song. That was their song. All right. Anyway, so he played the bass for that band during that time as they were touring, and someone told him about Jesus. He gave his life to Jesus. He became a Seventh-day Adventist, and he started witnessing to all of his family. And he said, I would come to my brother's house, and I would knock on the door, and he would hide and not answer the door. He said, so one day I came over there. When I saw him there, I hid. And when he came out, I said, hey, let's study the Bible. He said, I don't want to talk to you. He said, what? Why don't you want to talk to me? Because I know you have truth for me, and I don't want to learn anymore. We're not only responsible for the truth that we know, but we're responsible for the truth that we could know. Amen? If God sends opportunities for us to learn truth, and we deny that opportunity, we're responsible for that truth that he was going to share with us at that time. Amen? All right. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, the Bible says, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. What God requires from us is a willing mind, a surrendered heart, and as we learn more truth from him, he'll move us forward in his ways, and his timing. Amen? All right. So the reason why, the reason why there's a seven-day journey into heaven, a seven-and-a-half-day journey into heaven is because Jesus is training us for heaven. He's fitting all of his people all through time. He's given them what they need to know to live in heaven. He's explained to them the things that they didn't know now on their journey into heaven. 
And who do you think is going to prosper the most from this? That's kind of a bad question, because we're all going to prosper the most from it, right? But think of the thief on the cross. How much truth did he have when he was dying? He knew that Jesus was Christ, right? And Jesus says, you're going to be with me in heaven. He's going to have some learning to do, amen? And during this seven-day period, everything is going to be new to him, and he's going to love it. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be spaced out during this time or if Jesus is going to say, Jay, you think you know, but you really didn't know it. Here it is, right? I don't know what's going to be happening, but I can tell you this. I want to be on that trip. Amen? I want to be walking into heaven learning from the great master. All right. So now that we have covered the seals in their entirety and we went through them, now we're ready to go into the seven trumpets. How many of you could tell me right now what the seven trumpets represent? All right, good. So we're going to learn this together. All right, the seven trumpets are found in Revelation 8 and 9, but before we get to see what happens when the first angel blows the trumpet, we need to read a few verses and then get some background information on what trumpets actually mean. So Revelation 8, 1 through 3, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them that were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it up with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightning, and an earthquake. So that we can see that there's an intro into blowing the first trumpet. So God doesn't just say, and there's seven angels with seven trumpets, and the first angel blew his trumpet, and it went before that. There's an introduction scene to the seven trumpets. It's in the other sections of the book of Revelation. The symbolism of the trumpets is rooted, where do you think? Where do you think we're going to find the symbolization, the meaning of the symbolization of the trumpets? In the Old Testament, that's right. And why are we going to find it in the Old Testament? Because that's what John was using when he wrote the book of Revelation. Amen? Amen. 404 verses in Revelation and 276 are direct quotes or allusions from the Old Testament because they didn't have a New Testament when John was writing the book of Revelation. All right? So anytime we're going through the book of Revelation, the first place we're always going to look is the Old Testament. The second place we're going to look is in the New Testament. And outside of that, we're going to look at secondary sources. But then if they give us any information, we're going to try to bring them in harmony with the Bible. And if we can't do that, then we just can't explain it. Amen? All right. So, blowing trumpets is a well-established concept in the Old Testament. The life of Israel was basically ordered by trumpet blasts. In other words, if you heard a trumpet, you knew what it meant, you knew what the schedule meant. It was how your life was ordered. There are two words for trumpet in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to struggle with this because I did much better in Greek than I did with Hebrew. That's just a confession. But it's chat sasera, and that is not how a Hebrew teacher would say that. And if, if one of them were here, they would throw something at me right now. But chet sasera means hammered from metal. In other words, if you read it in Hebrew in the Old Testament and you read Chatsatsura, that means that this trumpet was made of metal. And then they had another trumpet that they blew, usually for worship time, and it was called the shofar. Does anybody know what the shofar was made out of? A ram's horn. And that's one that we're probably most familiar with because every time we watch a cartoon, every time we see a movie, they're blowing this ram's horn trumpet, right? It's all spiked and curled and going up in the air and they blow it up really loud, right? But they also had a metal one, okay? So, use of the trumpets in the Old Testament. Trumpets were used for war, number one, 1 Corinthians 14, 8. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound... Who will prepare for battle? So there was a sound that the trumpets were used when they were blown on. There was a sound that they made. And when the Israelites heard this sound, or the, or the northern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, when they heard this sound, they were to prepare for what? For war, battle. Very good. It also, though, was used in connection with religious festivals, calling people to religious festivals and for celebrating religious festivals. And it was also used to call people to religious services, temple services. So let's look at this. Open your Bibles to Numbers chapter 10. Open your Bibles to, to Numbers, the book of Numbers chapter 10. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. 
Numbers chapter 10, 1 through 10, we're going to get a description of what the trumpets were used for in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. The Bible says in Numbers 10, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that opposes, oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in your beginning of your month, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God." I am the Lord your God. So trumpets were used for war. They were, I'm sorry, for sounding an alarm, for war. They were used for religious gatherings, and they were used for offering services, right? Religious services, sacrificial services. All right? So Numbers 10, 8 through 10, those specific verses are the key in the Old Testament that unlocks the theological meaning of the Old Testaments. I'm sorry, the trumpets. So the passage in Numbers 10, 8 through 10, portrays trumpets as sacred instruments. They were, as a rule, used by priests in different contexts, worship, battle, harvest time, and festivals. They were blown for the purpose of calling on God to remember his covenant with his people. When the priests blew the trumpets over the sacrifices in the temple, God remembered his people and forgive their sins. During the religious festivals, the trumpet sound was a reminder that God would be faithful to his covenant promise and bless his people. In battle, the trumpet sound would call on God to help his people. During the time of King Abijah, Judah was at war against Israel. You can read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, but the verse I want to pick up is verse 14. And when Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear, and they cried out to the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. Now, if you were in a war, and you looked in front of you, nothing but a sea of soldiers, you're thinking in your mind, we need to fall back and regroup. And as you start falling back, you look behind you, and there's nothing but a sea of soldiers. At this moment, what are you going to do? There's only one thing left to do. Call upon God. God, I'm in trouble. I need you. God, I'm out here. I'm fighting this battle, but I'm not going to make it unless you intervene and do something. And as soon as the Israelites, as soon as the Judeans cried out, as soon as they cried out and said, Lord, help us, the priests sounded the trumpets. And as a result, God delivered Israel into Judah's hands. Blowing the trumpets went hand in hand with prayer. Lord, please rescue me. And God rescued his people. As they prayed God would rescue them, whether it was delivering them from their enemies or their sins, God rescued them. That's why the trumpet is so special in the Bible, because it's an instrument of God's deliverance. This is a crucial concept to understand as we go through the seven trumpets found in Revelation 8 and 9. 
The trumpets were associated with important events in Israel history, giving the law on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, 16, 20, verse 18. Based on what we just talked about, why do you think there was trumpets sounded when Moses was, or when God gave the law through Moses to the Israelites? It was a ceremony. Very good. Remember, the trumpets are associated with God delivering his people. Why were the trumpets sounded when the law was given to the Israelites? All too often, we look at God's laws as a standard against us, condemning us for what we do wrong. All too often, we look at God's law as something preventing us from doing something that we want to do. We say, oh, I can't do that because the law says this. I can't do that because God said this. I can't do that because of this. But in reality, God is trying to tell you what you can do. If you don't do this, you're going to have a peaceful life. If you don't do this, you're going to have an abundant life. If you don't do this, you're going to know what love is. If you don't do this, you're going to be in a better relationship with me. If you don't do this, you're not going to be separated from me. The law delivers us from sin. It keeps us from doing those things that lead to harm and injuries to ourselves. And that's why the trumpets were blown, because God was delivering his people from ignorance and a life that had no peace and no meaning and not worth living. And he gives this law to the people and suddenly they're delivered. Now they know how to interact with each other. Now they know how to interact with God. Now they have purpose. In the same way trumpets will be used, I'm sorry, in the same way I'm sorry, so they're given on the law of my, uh, 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 Mount Sinai, and they were blowing at the destruction of Jericho. You remember that Joshua was ordered to walk around the walls of the city every single day, and then on the seventh day, he was ordered to walk around it seven days or seven times, and at the end of the seventh time, the people were to shout, and the priests were to blow their trumpets, and as soon as that happened, what happened to the walls? They came crashing down. God delivered his people. They're also blown one more important time, and that is the day of the Lord in Joel chapter 2 and verse 1. That is the, the day which the Old Testament prophets referred to as the day of the Lord, as the second coming of Jesus. A trumpet sounds the return of Jesus. Go to Matthew 24, 31 really quick. Matthew 24, 31. Matthew 24, verse 31. Actually, I'm sorry, let's pick up. Let's, look at, let's start in verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a what? a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. We see the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, Paul is trying to tell us that there's something very special happening, and when it happens, we're going to know it because we're going to hear the trumpet of heaven shouting. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. Let's look at verse 51. Let's start at 51. 1 Corinthians 
15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? How many here can't wait until they hear that sound of the trumpet? And suddenly, our corruptible flesh is made incorruptible, and our corrupted minds, are, I'm sorry, our mortal bodies made immortal. It all begins with the sound of the angelic trumpet. And the last verse we want to look at, you've probably heard it at a funeral call, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll start at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. We're going to pick out the trumpet. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brother, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the what? The trump of God. And after the trumpet is sounded, what happens next? The dead in Christ shall rise. If you want to talk about the ultimate delivery, here it is. Jesus said, when I come back, I'm sounding my trumpet, and all those who are righteous, who died before us, before we came back, are going to be delivered from their graves, and they are going to live with me for all eternity. When there's blowing of the trumpets, it represents the deliverance of God's people. So when we go through the seven trumpets of Revelation, what do you think these trumpets, what do you think these trumpets are sounding? They're warnings against those who are persecuting God's people. Because the meaning of the trumpet is to deliver God's people. Amen? So next week, we'll go through the trumpets, starting with the first one. Is there any questions or comments tonight? All perfectly clear as mud, right? <laughs> All right, well, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your deliverance, Lord. We thank you in advance because we know it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen soon, Lord. We can read the, we can read the tea leaves, Father. We know the signs of the times. We know. What's happening around us is marking events in history that, in Earth's history that haven't happened before and are getting worse. And we know that when these things come, we are to look up. Father, we are looking up to you with ears pierced, listening for that trumpet of God to sound and deliver us from this world of, of darkness, Father. I ask that every one of us will be ready. And as we study more into Revelation, may it be more and more clear and may be more and more prepared for that time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.